Hi, it's Paul from Devon Gunsmith. Today's task is to antique an Indian replica dog lock pistol for a customer. Um, here's one I prepared earlier, as they say. This one needs shipping off. So what we're attempting to achieve is this dark, slightly rusty uh, effect. Um, so this one's an inert pistol, so it's not a live firearm certificate required. It's just a wall piece. The client specifically asked it needed to look antique. There are some clues to a conservator or a authenticator of antiques that will, will indicate this is not a real one. Um, some of the pseudo proof marks just don't match anything historically correct. Um, there's a few other things as well, but I'm not going to disclose them for obvious reasons. <clears throat> so this is how they come off the boat. All highly shiny, just don't look right at all. Now, of course, the reenactors probably like them like this because they're react reenacting 1642 Civil War, most commonly in the UK. And they want them to look like they've just literally been handed them in, in issue from their commanding officer. So quite often they need to be looking kind of new in the reenactment world. But most people who want wall hangers want them to look a little less brash than this. They've got this toffee kind of stain on them that's just not authentic. And uh, that needs stripping back and then a decent wood stain applied, oiled and waxed. So it looks a bit more like a, an old English gun. So that's the task for today. This one will probably get shipped because she's been waiting for it for a good while. Um, I'm gonna just show you how to make this one antiqued. And uh, because they're inert, they have never been firearms in the UK, they get, the barrels get treated as if they were deactivated. So I'll be able to show you that shortly. Okay, first things first, we need to strip it down, don't we? So let's get on with that. Barrel off first. the tripod off that's not a good start is it pins out and you can see there's blemishes on these already as is often the case <clears throat> right so the locks off about to withdraw the pins. Oops. So you get spanner rash. There we go. So this mimics a deactivated musket. This was never used or fired or registered as a gun. So when they came into the UK, the wholesalers immediately placed them into a deactivation mode, even though the flash holder's never been fired. That's just a, just, just a, a dot punch mark. It's not even a real flash hole. So that's 
how they look. What we have to do here is very carefully extract this square nail without wiggling it too much. <clears throat> First find my pliers, here they are. Right. So without with it, loosening it and opening the hole too much, I need to just ease that out. And it takes a minute. It does take a minute. Very gently ease that off. Always a bit of a trick because you don't want to bruise the wood. Just makes for more work down the line. And this one's going to be an awkward one. And normally not that difficult to do. But here we go, it's coming. It's got to be wiggled out without actually opening the hole that it's in too much. <coughs> there it is, released. So finger guard, done. The pommel is staying where it is because they're just too fiddly to take out and you end up loosening them up too much. <clears throat> Trigger stays in as well. We can work with it there. <clears throat> so there's your bits as they stand. So the next step is to degrease all the metal components and start the aging process. Okie doke. <clears throat> I'm going to use a proprietary gun degreaser. Um, product placements are not really the idea here. Unfortunately I can't recommend you any because that breaches YouTube um, requirements gunsmithing um, you can use alcohol America they call it Everclear we call it meths in this in England <clears throat> you can use dish soap you can use engine cleaners the spray type or whatever all of that is good stuff so bearing in mind that we're not actually wanting to achieve um, functioning lock we could lose that spring for example but I'm going to leave it intact gives people options so we're not doing anything complicated here it's simply a decreasing process get rid of any preservative or cleaning oils that were there now with like a scotch bright pad um, at a pinch, you could use one of those um, scouring pads that you get from the supermarket to, for dishwashing and pan cleaning. That kind of thing will be fine. I should be wearing gloves as well because this does strip out a bit of the oil in the, in the skin. But a bit of a cowboy like that. Right, so let's place this out of arm's way a minute. So very lightly scour, not, you're not looking for a dull surface. This will become evident why in a minute. Um, let's clean that, degrease it. You don't have to do the bits that are go, don't, don't show. If you're looking to be frugal with your materials and your cleaning products, it's not an essential. We're just gonna slightly dull the surface. This is an antiquing process. So we're actually looking at pseudo antiquing, should I say. These are reproduction. They're not intended to be used. They're, they're dummy reproductions. It's certainly not the intention to mislead or defraud anybody by saying it's a, an antique because anybody with any know-how will look at this and go, it's not an antique. It looks like a reenactment gun. <clears throat> However, just got to put the warning there. So the lock, decrease the lock. All right, so you've got to put like 400 years of exhaustion and tiredness 
into a perfectly nice lock. You can strip it all out, but for expediency, I'm just going to show you how you do it without stripping it. I'm going to go and get some, wash this out and rinse off the components and then I'll be back. And we're back as if by magic. I've just cleaned them all, rinsed them off with some hot water. I'm going to just use a little bit of meths, methylated spirit, ethanol, everclear, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's alcohol. But it's industrial alcohol. Uh, you potentially could use isopropyl alcohol or something like that as well. What I'm doing here is right, gloves on time. <clears throat> right, okay. So gloves on, bit of alcohol to just clean these components up. What I'm going to do is very lightly abrade this. In all the areas where it would be in contact with humans. Just let that dry. I did wash these, rinse these down with hot water so that theoretically it will dry. Now there's a small residual amount of water on these. It's nothing to worry about because we're basically treating it the absolute opposite of way you would do any other work on a gun. <laughs> and occasionally I have had to do this, especially with conservancy of an old English shotgun. Sometimes when you've stripped it all back and cleaned all the rust off it, it just looks weird. It looks like some, well, it looks like a reproduction piece. This looks completely wrong. So I have actually done a minor version of this without the rusting phase uh, in the past. Well, as you can see, that's starting to look pretty grotty now, that liquid. I'll just clear that liquid away. So at this point, depending on what materials or chemicals you might have, you can go one of two ways. I've got gunsmith bluing salts which has a slight acidity to it and a few other chemicals in it that do allow me to do this quite quickly you can passivate this with something like white wine vinegar which will have some of these uh, effects this is a bluing salt so this is what we would use if we were bluing guns. I'd use it slightly better than this, but uh, nonetheless, it still gets the same results. And as you can see, because we've degreased it, it's blued up quite quickly. This is a cold blue I'm doing here. They're not always cold blue. Now, I'm not looking for a perfect result. I do want those edges to look like they've been aged for a long time and it's not just happened overnight so there we go it's not a perfect result as yet probably need to just abrade this here a little bit get that to take because we're not heating it we might have a bit of grease there there you go it's going okay now, it, it looks almost perfectly blued or blacked, but uh, that's not actually what we're headed for. But on the barrel, we only need to do this edge. It, if it dribbles down, doesn't matter. We're putting a copious coating on there. This then gets it to black up. Um, standard gunsmithing, bluing, blacking. It's nothing to do with the colour of the salts that means bluing. This is uh, hard to show on camera, but it's it's a blue-grey colour, in fact. And if we, uh, we were doing this to blue or black up a gun in the traditional bluing salts methods, 
we boil between each pass and a pass is what I'm doing here and you, on your old English shotgun you'd get something like this possibly up to 16 times with carding in between because there is a rusting process that occurs as well um, and browning is a rusting process as well unfortunately my armory where I'm working today is humidity controlled not unfortunately fortunately for all my customers who've got guns in storage I hate to add there you go now the screws they just need a dip just like that this stuff is no good once it's been used out of the bottle you cannot return it otherwise it will completely neutralize everything from all the little uh, iron components that are in there blew the pins just dip in these in here see how the colors changing because it's reacting with the metal that's a little bit to do with the acidity once again so with the lock if this is your choice you can dismantle it I have done so in the past and I've only coated the outer edges However, this one is merely for uh, wall hanging. So I'm literally just going to drip it on, brush it in and let it start doing its magic. Obviously, if this had, was being fired with black powder, you could get it to do this very quickly. Just don't clean the gun. The sulfuric acid from the sulfur reaction in the black powder would get you this look very quickly and it would rust, rust overnight because of the sulfuric acid anyway if you don't have access to bluing salts you could use white wine vinegar and five percent solution of common table salt or sea salt in water you will get the bluing effect, the the, uh, the rusting effect, which you can then knock back with heat to get a bluing effect. So that's another way of doing it. Occasionally you get a gun with a funny steel and uh, they don't respond to the normal bluing techniques that gunsmiths use. Fortunately, I've got in the same county as me, a London barrel finisher, excellent guy. I did have a, I confess to having one that had really flummoxed me and uh, he very kindly and generously said to me, what you need to do, Paul, is, and I'm not going to tell you what he told me, because we got to keep something to ourselves, haven't we? There you go, it's just starting to blow off. Okay, if I leave that unwashed, untended, and leave it not here I've got a little outhouse and because they're not actually firearm components because there's no compression components here they will rust overnight and that would help me enable me to get on with the job anyway there are some other items here scouring stick don't need that right now I'm not taking that scouring stick retainer out they're a pain to put back. Same with the trigger. Just give it an abrasion. And same with the pommel. Just a braid. Right, so you will see me stripping this down, this stock down in a sec in a while. Well, it'll be in a second in your video. Oh sorry, I was off camera, didn't realise too carried away with the work right so I'm oh, back on camera yes I am so I will do the first treatment of the pommel before I strip all this nasty toffee colored goodness knows what it is finish that the nice men up in the 
Kyber Pass or wherever it is they make these guns. It's quite actually, there are some videos um, about and they do look quite nice. They're amazing really. They work in bare feet, sitting in the sand with um, bare feet. I'm like flipping X. Health and safety would go mad in this country. And they're producing all kinds of firearms actually, but uh, these are the ones that particularly of interest to us today. Certainly, yeah. Uh, right now anyway. All right, you think this looks like a right bodge? I did actually chuckle actually on one of my videos showing uh, me using an orbital sander somebody was quite sweary and went you know what on earth are you playing at using an orbital sander what orbital sander that's pretty terrible gunsmithing I liked and loved and laughed because uh, the guy doesn't know what the trade are doing <laughs> oh Parazzi Perdasoli well, just about all the gun makers nowadays, the modern gun makers, they're actually using orbital sanders all the time. You can't produce something fast enough for the money unless you do. That's them. That's the way it is these days. It's not like it was in the do old day when you get a, <clears throat> a gentleman hand sanding your gun stock for days at an end for a threepence halfpenny. And a cottage in Birmingham, down on the side streets, I suspect. Anyway, I digress. So there we go. One unholy mess. It's funny, actually. This is blowing really well. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? If this was a nice, a nice old English shotgun, it would take ages to blow. Sometimes they just don't. The Spanish shotguns are the worst. The Spanish steel is quite bizarre. Anyway, there we have it. So I've got to discard this bluing solution now because it will go over. Okay, so I've uh, put everything in a plastic receptacle. And that is roughly what it's looking like now. It's got a sort of darkish blue. I, I'm not going for a perfect look on this occasion. So it's quite freeing from my point of view. Now, I'm, it's raining today outside, so I've got a little porchway that's not 100% sealed. So I'm gonna put those non-firearm parts in my porchway tonight. Uh, the humidity out there should put a nice little sheen of brown rust all over those components. And I can grow that as long as I like. And uh, using 5 wire wool, such as this stuff, it's very fine. I can then card back what I don't want to see there. So I'm just going to pop them in my humidifier, aka outside, in an outhouse. Okay, just thought of uh, something um, you might like to try. Um, I've just sprayed an ordinary household cleaner. One of those degreaser types and I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit of good old-fashioned table salt on my items. It's kind of a bit random oh. and the, the, the idea behind this is it's already wetted so I can just sprinkle that over my components, season them to taste <laughs> right that will create a sea salt environment obviously and uh, I don't have to make a special preparation then for uh, a spray bottle or anything I think my last one got thrown out like you know, when people you know you know people tidy up behind you so That will probably accelerate the process a little bit. I'm trying to put 300 years of patina and age into something that's 
obviously brand new. So I'm going to pop that into my uh, conditioning area, aka my wet and drafty porch. Obviously, I don't want the pinch get bit, the parts getting pinched, so I will be putting them somewhere discreet. But none of these are actually firearm parts, so it's not breaking the law to do so. If my armory wasn't perfect humidity, I'd leave them indoors, but it'll take longer. So I'm looking to do this and have this recorded for you tomorrow. Oh, as an aside, you can actually reassemble the gun and do some of the aging processes with it in place, which means it kind of rusts in place. It, looks for, it goes for an authentic look. And I'm just about to get the stripper so we can start stripping this down. OK, so I'm going to use a dichloromethane style paint stripper. There are several brands that will be like this. It's in a gel form. I think the most common one named in the UK would be Nitromorse. Um, I buy it industrially, so I don't use Nitromorse. And you need a communal garden stainless steel scrunchy style strip um, scouring pad. All right, so you dab this on and you must dab it on. You can't really brush it on because you don't get the thickness layer that you want. And invariably you have to go back and do bits. This is common actually in restoring other normal gun rifle, gun rifle and shotgun stocks as well. Especially when they've got some really nasty finish on them. A lot of the manufacturers are favorite favoring resin based gun oils. They call them gun oils still, but they're not really. They're quite quite nasty synthetic coatings of course don't do what i'm doing wear gloves folks All right. i'm always on the fly doing these things and i always forget to glove up it literally takes a second doesn't it I'll wear black ones because I can see where the holes, if I'm getting a hole coming through, you're losing protection. Uh, anyway, back to the job in hand. I feel a bit safer now because this stuff burns. So, you know, health and safety warnings, etc, etc. Don't try this at home if you don't feel safe. All the other usual. Admonitions and all that, right. This stuff gives off fumes as well, so you need to do it in a ventilated room. And I'm slopping it all over the place for the critics, everybody. Don't do this on your best dining room french polished table it won't go well down well with the significant other or your mother or other relatives are available right. probably can some of you are having conniption fits on flopping it everywhere it's essential to get this stuff on on it quickly that's the table sacrificial. And look, see, burnt straight through. I'm gonna get that off quick. Wash. Gotta get it off quick, look, it's ripping the glove apart. This is what I'm saying, look, it's nasty stuff. Only way to do it, and paint strippers the only way. Catch you soon, I gotta wash my hands. Right, glove up again, obviously. Hands are sticky. Right, I'm going to grab a bit of kitchen roll so that I'm not touching the uh, paint stripper quite so much. Just 
to slightly insulate my grip. Okay, so with your scouring pad, even now, that will start to come off. I don't know why they put that awful stuff on because the uh, the wood they make these stocks from is quite nice. It doesn't take a lot of zhuzhing up to uh, make them look quite pleasant. I imagine it's because they probably scarf pieces together. Always knocking this camera. I've got to sort that out. I have to make a fixed stand or something for it. And if it's wobbling, it's because the table's wobbling. So yeah, you slough off all this yucky, sticky, plasticky coating that they've used. And look, see, gloves going again. Occasionally, I get a customer, usually a reenactor, who wants me to order them one of these cheap Indian guns as a firearm or a musket. And uh, of course, I'm happy to do so. They get what they pay for, I'm afraid. But uh, I've done this once or twice when they said, can you do your treatment on it? So it doesn't look like, so they want, <laughs> I've got to watch what I say there. They want their musket to look like it didn't come from India. They don't want it looking like an Indian gun. So everybody in the reenactment world will go, oh yeah, it's an Indian, isn't it? But, uh, Unfortunately, we don't have the pennies for the English built guns, it's muskets and stuff like that. So they quite often say, oh, can you give me one of your treatments? Costs a little bit extra for them, but it's nothing like a, a price of a hand built one. You can see how this is going. There's some bits now that are starting to dry up. It's going to take a minute. I'm just going to brush this clear. clear. We're getting there. Right, I'm going to just quickly tidy up this off camera because it's tedious and I'll get back to you. Right then, so I'll give it a bit more of a splash with the remainder from there. And I've got a glass of water with my scouring pad in it. That neutralises the stuff, the stuff, the stripping agent, more so than ever. And there will be some little sticky bits and I have to go and manually remove those. But now I can neutralize the majority of it. Now, like I say, there'll be some little bits I have to clear up. Now I've got a sewage treatment plant here where I live in the countryside so I have to dispose of all these chemicals responsibly. 
it's not good to just flush all these things down the sink either, really. I do know people that will, though, but when you're not dealing with the dilutions of a main sewer, which are many thousands of litres flushing down, where a small amount of chemical like this wouldn't harm, you can't do that into a sewage tank that's a treatment plant with using biodiversity and all that stuff. So, just a warning if you live in the countryside, don't be doing this and then flushing all the washings down your septic tank or other sewage treatment plant. Not a good idea. That's also in case my neighbours are watching this video and they go, oh, what's he doing? Ah, it's him. He's abusing our tanks. But I can tell you I'm not. It costs you much to install. amazingly stingy that stuff. It's got a little stingy bit. I wipe my, fan, wipe my fingers off. Yeah, so. Even the, um, this is I get this from a car body shop. Uh, car body painters. A lot of uh, gun finishes can be found all the solvents they're in of uh, can be found for guns at a paint finishing shop. Um, uh, I said, what's your usual way of clearing this off? He said, oh, well, when we use a power washer. So you could, if you had a power washer, a pressure washer, you could use that. See how I'm scouring away at this, and it's not really making a lot of difference to that bluing I've done already. It's relatively robust. I'm not bothered, though, because we're looking for something. We're trying to antique and distress this so all the rough trump treatment we give it doesn't really matter doesn't really cause us any problems it's just part of the distressing process you need you know what I mean but these techniques are very similar to ones we use in uh, refurbishing a gun stock sometimes the brutalist methods are the quickest and therefore the least cost effect the least costly to the customer. I hope the camera's not wobbling about too much. I've got to fix up some kind of permanent gimbal. But at the moment, we're in March. And I'm so behind with clients' work. Um, and you may have noticed I've skipped a few months because all of a sudden the gun world wants everything done which is fine i don't have a problem with it it's just a feast or famine situation in the gun trade we never never get used to it right i'm just going to give that a rinse off clean it up let it dry and then tomorrow we'll join you up again and i will conclude the finishing stages but obviously this needs to be allowed to i need to wash this off freshly clean it up dry it clean up the table and uh, then we'll go into the staining and the uh, polishing and oiling processes for the stock and with any luck we'll have a nice incrustation of rust that we can card off on the gun the black components i will give this a clean and i will put a little bit of uh salt on that and wet it and, and same with the trigger guard and same with the scouring hook for now that's what we're going to leave it there and i'll see you in the morning which will be in a second on the video okay so 24 hours have passed you can hear the dehumidifier going flat out so that i can get this to fully dry out and start to encrust in a rusty yucky kind of thing the lock is still not affected because I didn't remove any grease from that. This is a fast track method. I have actually taken the lock apart and done it that way as well. It's starting to rust up nicely now. 
mainly because it's already got a film of rust on it and it's just now starting to dry. Um, I'll leave it to dry with the, the dehumidifier on and then next we'll show, I'll show you how we'll stain the stock which will be nicely dried by then. You see there's a few blemishes there. They don't actually matter too much. It adds to the distressed look if you like. It looks like a bit of driftwood at the moment but uh, that's because I've really blanched it with the cleaning products. These pins will need to be allowed to rust a little bit which I'll do once we've actually waxed up the whole thing. And uh, we will apply another um, set of bluing on that. Oh, just realised the barrel's missing. Right, here's the barrel. <laughs> As you can see, the bluing's taken force. Where I've sprinkled a little bit of salt on it, it's peppered it a little bit. This is not a faithful antiquing process. This is purely to get the general vibe of an antique we're not trying to fake antiques this is not lovejoy is what i'm saying <laughs> for those of you who might remember lovejoy this is still a bit stained so i'm going to need to rub this down and stain it but we'll do that in the next in the next portion so for now at least we're just going to let that dry out completely and thoroughly so that the rust start stains and marks show nicely we will use some more bluing salts on the uh, metal parts because as you see it does start to sort of lift off a bit and it's you've got a, a bit of a not a patina exactly but you're getting a little bit of a slightly roughened surface which is what the we're intending to, intending to do i mean if you look at my well-worn and used pliers which are like 40 years old obviously they get worked and used every day they have some of this naturally naturally encrustation and a sort of natural dirty bluing occurring. Um, if you look at my newer ones, they do because they're always being in contact with corrosive substances. So, you know, even the screwdrivers get that. And occasionally I clean them and blue them, but usually a good coat of oil does the same thing. So we're, we're accelerating the natural degradation of metal for a specific purpose to get a nice wall hanging pistol. Uh, it's not our intention to defraud or pretend that these are antiques, it's just to give an antique -y feel so that, that people who like to buy them and collect them as inert weapons, um, they're fake weapons if you will because they've never been used or proofed as you can see they've got a slot and it's been slotted as if it were a deactivation but it's never been licensed as a weapon so it's not a deactivated weapon even though it has to all intents and purposes the same characteristics it's impossible to make it fire is what it is so there we have it um, the next step once this is fully dried is I will blue these sections on the stock I will show you the techniques for uh, staining and um, sealing and oiling which gives it this nice effect. The effect that we have here. So you can see there's a little bit of pseudo fake pitting, making it look older. Um, it's all been stained and oiled and sealed and burnished. And it has a nice looking effect, all this, all this screws look right the pins have a little bit but they're not always because you get you tend to burnish that off now at that point at point of delivery you may wish to burnish a bit of this put a bit of wear natural wear where you would naturally have wear you can put a bit of wear naturally there and across here using a bit of 50 wire wool um, you can oil it you can grease it you can make it a little better you can take it further than this essentially basic antiquing and so you can have a really nice replica weapon on your wall to suit your country house pub or whatever this one's intended for a pub in Exmoor um, that has a lot of history about a particular highwayman that used to roam those parts and so this is perfect because it's bang on period uh, 
so that will nicely fit in with their other displays that they have at a fraction of the cost you wouldn't want to hang on a pub wall a genuine antique because you'd have to like securely screw it to the wall so it didn't get pinched or something um, when these antique these are antiques they're selling for 1200 1300 pounds because they have the full provenance this sort of thing is about 450 when it's finished and delivered so you can see that it's it's worth it if you need that kind of uh, antique artifact look in your life got a little bit drier now so now we're going on to the next steps so we'll just get the metal work done for a minute again a bit more blooming salts not massive amounts we're just touching in now and this is the one I've been using so, so you just dab it on it will it on the first instance and appear to reduce the rust it won't know it just works better this way you've got a little bit of acid passivating from the from the blooming salts but it gives you that rough sort of antiqued look as you can see there again we're not using loads of this right so in the case of the pins and screws are called pins as well not many people know that but they were all pins originally so when screws came along they still continue to call them pins there you go so you notice i'm only doing the the heads on this occasion absolutely no need to do any more and same with the the actual pins we're only just dabbing the ends no point getting them completely rusted out Okay, now very judicious and careful application on the lock. I don't actually want it completely rusting up in case the customer wants to be able to uh, snap the lock. It's purely a cosmetic effect on what is basically a brand new lock. But very judicial at this point we're not slathering it on we're just touching in just to get that darkened agent aged look remove a little bit not too much but just a little bit of the rust it's now done its job it's now quite effectively Put a bit of an age on that which is similar to but not quite the same as what we do when we uh blew a real gun uh, you know a modern gun or a, a reproduction or indeed a new gun again we're not looking to make a huge mess there Just want to get rid of the newness, that's all. Very carefully. Because obviously, uh, you don't, uh, while you're doing it, if it depends how long you've got. If you've got time to mess about with this, then all well and good. But I don't, I'm doing a video. I've got a backlog of work uh even still in march still working on jobs that were handed in to me during the lock between the lockdowns in anticipation of me getting on with it i had such a lot of backlog i'm actually working quite tightly never heard a gunsmith complain about being too busy have you uh, probably don't 
everybody's gone mad. Theatres are opening up. I've had inquiries from theatres and reenactment groups saying they need pistols. Obviously, they will be sort of new looking pistols. And they will probably be the blank fire style, which the reenactors like. There we go. Reenactors and the theatre companies like blank firers that they don't require a license for. But the Violent Crimes Reduction Act 2006, Section 7, clearly states that you can have a realistic imitation firearm for the use of reenactment and theatre, provided that you can prove you are a reenactor or part of a theatre company. That's the exemptions. There you go. That's the metal work done with a very minimal use. Now that's going to be set aside and allowed to dry. Meanwhile, I'm going to prepare most of the stock just to save time.
So why use quick kitchen roll, you may exclaim judgmentally. <laughs> uh, it's more eco-friendly. It's made from cotton fibres. Um, I can actually put it in with my wood burner to dispose of. That is an ecological disposing of the um, spirit stains, which will dry. Uh, use them as fire lighters, along with any oils that I might have used, which is linseed oil. So that will burn, and also linseed will automatically combust any cotton fibres, so you can actually have a what's the word instantaneous combustion. So you have got to be careful with that. Right, so I've actually taken off some, as you can see. That is the way of it. You don't want blotchy effects. You don't want it looking like it's only just been done because that spoils the effect of what you're trying to achieve. As you can see by rubbing it, you can bring up a bit of the luster and a bit of the grain. See, this is what we're trying to achieve. So sort of like accelerate a hundred years of aging. In fact, some of the Royal Armoury pieces from the Civil English Civil War period, so 1642 onwards, um, up to Monmouth Rebellion, which is uh, off the top of my head, I think it's 1685. I'll put something down here if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm just waffling. Right, so... There we have it. It's looking half decent. We want to let that dry for a little bit, don't we, really? It's not going to ooze dye now. So that looks probably a bit like how it looked before. The difference is amazingly different there. Uh, it's not anything like that's plasticky, the coating is not plasticky at all. Now this is still drying, so while I have it still drying, just gonna burnish it a little bit with some 50, 5000, five zeros, 50 wire wool. This is just to get any loose fibers up and it softens the appearance. Keep knocking me camera, sorry guys. I have to find a more permanent way of attaching the camera to the table. Right, so that's, you may see there's a slight sheen on that now. There wasn't there before because it was lifting the fibres. This is all part of the uh, French polishing approach, I guess you would say. And also by burnishing it, you can take off a little bit of the stain where the high traffic areas for one of a better expression where it would have been handled would have a different kind of patina so it's slightly lighter now you see because uh, we'll add shellac to seal it which was used traditionally anyway uh, so wherever possible try to replicate the finishes Again, we're not doing a love joy here. We're not trying to uh, cheat anybody. <laughs> oh, flipping camera. <laughs> right, I'm going to let that dry for a second. But you can see it's starting to look a little bit sort of older-ish and less plasticky. Because that um, coating they put on in India... It's almost like a brown plastic coat. It loses, it loses all the tone and quality. You do see occasionally there's a little bit blob of that stuff there. Just give that a scrape. Just a tiny dab. Okay. So you can quite quickly fix things. I saw one around here somewhere as well. 
There's a tiny bit of that gunk still here, look. Just where you don't want it, while you'll be looking at the top of the piece. burnishing bump them off. I did say it won't matter it won't uh, but in certain areas where you want it to look a certain way you don't want great globs of modern plasticky crap on it crap's a technical word by the way Thomas Crapper, a fine purveyor of porcelain toilets. So yeah, Crapper is a correct, crappy. <laughs> Give you your etiology. I'm just waffling, you can tell, can't you? Oh, yeah, it's not, not so rubbishy now. There we go. I can actually tell that's evaporated while I've worked on it. So I'm thinking about wadding up a bit of this and making a little polishing button. And I'm thinking I'm going to use a clear button polish on this. It's actually dark enough off camera just shaking up the bottle oh. okay special pale french polish not a lot of color to it and we're not actually french polishing all we're doing is sealing the grain for the purposes of those who want to know but look at that pop Look at that popping up. You can see those letterings pop up again now. And their luster's really popping up in quite quick order. Now, I can rub a bit of that on there. It won't matter. It'll protect that metal. Which is quite a common thing on old, old English side-by-side -side shotguns. You see that all the time. They've actually gone over. So you can see now there's a more golden luster to that. And if I can find my linseed oil, I can start burnishing that. We're not using this as a French polish per se, just using it as a sealant. Okay, I'll see if I can get this in the camera line. And you've got to pull it on quickly. It will pull. A bit of the stain off. I'm okay with that. That's fine because I want to lift a bit of the stain to look, make it look like it's a natural wear and tear. Uh, you will find it pulled so you've got to be careful in your application. This dark mahogany stain really has made it pop. Now it's an option for those who might be interested when I make blank firers, I use these as a basis for it. It's the only quick and easy way to make an efficient, cost-effective blank firer for theatrical use. You can opt to have this hand finished. I don't generally because the reenactment world are notoriously tight and want everything at the cheapest price. Most cost-effective price, I should say. But I hand finish my guns like this for my own use, so not a problem, can be done. It'll cost you a wee bit extra. There's time to get a little bit of machine on that now. Okay, now if I was going into full polishing mode, I would knock this back, let it dry, knock it back with some 5 0 once again, and do it again. But I'm not actually looking to polish this, I'm just sealing it. And while I'm off camera chatting, I'm looking for my linseed oil which I think is down here yeah you want a bit of boiled linseed oil again off camera and doing the flipping thing right using the same bit of button that you created 
This would typically be a cotton wad with a cotton wool body if you were going into that. Right, you now then simply apply straight on top of that. Some of your French polishers out there will be shrieking, what are you doing, Paul? The purpose of this is to get that shellac to burnish in while it's still a little bit tacky. We want to create the impression at least of 300 years of polishing and hanging back on the wall. You can, in the old days, they used linseed uh, for everything to include, include uh, up to and including the gun barrels and the gun metal. So you can be quite authentic and liberally coat everything with linseed. It's not a problem. It's perfectly acceptable. This will not shine up as it is right now. It's just creating that effect. Right. So you can see that that's all nicely just soaking in there. It's a fairly liberal coating. You should cap. Yes, you can see the, the gleam of the natural linseed. Not plastic looking. If you look at the closeness of the grain, it's got a nice grain in there. You can burnish this in with your fingers now. Because you won't, the shellac won't stick to your hands. And you can hand burnish this. If you don't like it, if it's too shiny and you want a slightly more rougher look because you uh, want it to look a bit dull, just knock it back with a little bit of 5.0 again. There we go. Looking pretty. I don't think the camera does it truly justice, but uh, let's see if I can catch the grain for you. My lighting need improving a bit. There we go. No, it's not really showing it, is it? You get the general impression. It looks more natural than the, the appearance of the stuff that comes in. Right, so before, without much ado, I'm going to quickly start oiling the parts with a fresh piece of fresh piece of kitchen roll, just to prevent further rusting and corrosion. And you're just going to dab that on. You don't want to knock the surface up. If I wanted to put copious amounts, if I was doing loads of them, I'd have a brush and I'd do copious amounts of tapping and brushing. I'm only doing the one today, so I'm just going to quickly brush that in. In fact, what the heck? I've got a little clean brush here. I can just dab that on. Anything comes out of the bottle can't go back in the bottle, obviously. I have got some dropper bottles somewhere. Right, so I can now brush this on. Just to cease the corrosion effect to some degree. I'm going to put a liberal amount on. I'm going to leave it on there just to seal off that that carefully created rust blue effect I'm trying to get the camera angle right but it doesn't look so yucky i'll just seal that in there that'll hold the rust and then just dab them all i'm going to put a bit of kitchen roll down My table gets abused enough, so I don't need to add to the problem. Yep, so just quickly seal that in. Um, gunsmiths use something called dewatering oil. This is a standard gun oil. So you could use um, any oil that has some corrosion inhibitive properties. Motor oil will do. You don't have to go out and specially buy something. Gunsmiths use proprietary oils because they've got to get consistent fish and finish constantly but in this case we're only just prettying up something that was brand new <laughs> and it's, it has to be somewhat liberal because you need to uh, exclude the oxygen from the rusting process 
Back in the day, linseed oil and tallow were used commonly. So, uh, there we go. And continue. Obviously, we need to rub this over with a bit of wire. Well, we don't want corrosion in the threads. I'm not going to do it right now. I'll do that off camera. I'll do it like that so you get some oil in there. Again, if I had a lot to do, I'd have a pot or something and I'd just drop a load of oil in it and brush it down. Um, if you're doing one gun like this, you only need to just dab it. As you can see the, the antique style aging. Down here in Devon we have a very good reclamation site called, I think it's Toby's Yard or Raffley's or something like that. You wouldn't see them in in there because these are obviously new guns, but those kind of guys have been known to obtain reenactment guns and the like for the purposes of war hangers, set design and stuff like that. It's quite handy. So you can see that the corrosion's worked its way up now. And it looks okay. There's fake stamps that, proof marks that don't actually relate to anything historical, but it adds a bit of flair. And I've run out of oil. Look at that. Well, I never. But you do need to inhibit the rusting process now. It's done its job not the intention to have it destroyed. I need a tiny drop more. I need to find an empty dropper bottle because usually I just drizzle it in with a dropper bottle. Oh, hang on, what's that? Could that be what I'm looking for? I think it is. Look, dropper bottle. This might be dewatering oil, which is the other oil, which is, oh no, this is mineral oil. This is uh, gun oil, so. Duh, for plunker. There we go. Got a bit of a busy table now, so. And there we have it. How to wreck a perfectly nice modern replica to look old for the, for the benefit of the a wall hanging. Get rid of that oil, put the lid back on. And there you have it. Next is assembling. Right, don't worry if you get some drizzles. Gun oil. It's all... Whatever they had, they would have used, believe you me, they would have used tallow, candle wax, whatever. That would have been tallow, I suppose. <laughs> so there we go. Tomorrow... I'm going to show you how to put it all back together again and we'll see if there's any more corrosion appeared because we've got to inhibit the corrosion. You can see now that the barrels, I don't know if I can get it in the camera light, have got a sort of aged pitting look about them. They don't look like they're in the best of condition. But uh, we'll see how that looks in the morning. You'll be going, Paul, you didn't do the lock. Quite well spotted, just testing. Right. So once again, same again. Same thing. Brush it in, drizzle it in. Oh, I've got a drizzler now, haven't I? Yeah. So. It's a work messy workbench bench, so don't worry about this. 
if you're using your best dining room table, I would put some newspaper or plastic bags or something down. For goodness sake, don't come saying to me, oh, Wolf wasn't impressed. I go, well, common sense. See, even my rough table, I use a little bit of some kind of cloth to contain it. It's just not worth the trouble. Right, I can disturb some of the rust. So it looks like it's been there a bit longer than it has. There you go. That's it. Done. Again, it won't hurt to put some actual gun oil on the actual lock because if they want to snap it, all of this mechanism still works properly. And it's faithfully a reproduction of the real thing. Ta-da! Okay, time to tidy up. <clears throat> and get ready to assemble all of this. So the barrel obviously drops straight into the inletting quite easily. At that point it will hold itself there for a minute. I'm going to leave these dripping in oil for a minute. We can always wipe it off excess, the excess off later date, but I want to keep it fairly, fairly moist just for the next few days. Holding that in place, just line that up there, obviously, to pull back the trigger guard, trigger from the trigger guard, as it's likely to be a bit, a bit stiff, I'm trying to do it all one handed there. Look, I hope I can only check the camera. Right, <clears throat> I've got to make it so you can see it. Long screw out of all the ones you've got, and just pop that in there. Okay, just catch it with the screwdriver, and there you go. I'm not going mad with it at the moment. Right, so you're going to line that hole there, take the square nail, tap it in. Nothing too hard. Now the beauty of it is it will rust in place now, so there's a likelihood that it'll actually stay put. Oh, you want me to brace it on the table? I'm trying to show you what I'm doing. Pins. There's nearly always a shorter one, which nearly always is the front pin. Now, you've got to be careful. You see there's a bit of a blowout there. Not done by me. By the Indian chaps. They obviously hid it by uh, various means of tapping and crap into them. Right, so you need to brace that now. We're going for that to go through. It's not going through. You've got to loosen this. Each of these barrels is made in India to match the stock it's going into. There's no one size fits all here. There you go, it's going in. Right. We'll leave it there. That's, re that's retaining. There is also a little slope on these pins, so you do need to be aware of that as well. Now that's found its home there, straight away. And I use the back of a screwdriver, so I don't want to mark up what I've already done. There you go. So now you can tighten that down with some impunity. And we're ready to inlet the lock. 
And again, I'm not going to take an excess off the lock. I'm just going to pat it dry. It all goes to the narrative of what we are trying to create and you know, a somewhat semi conserved old gun. Right, so trigger forward, a little bit of furtling about, that just slides straight in. And again, you can give it a little tap, holding it. There's three screws once again they do have a slight difference in length it is a kind of suck it and see i always take the longest one and try it in that slot you can of course make a little tray and uh, just be sure that's coming in a bit short that they, they uh they are a bit variable i'm not gonna lie it's a little bit of trial and error to be fair. You'll think, oh, these never came out of this gun. There we go, that's coming up flash there. Don't over tighten that until you've got this one in as well. Oops. It's always a little bit harder to do because you're doing it for the camera. There you go, it's flash. See, it's just slight lower a flush. So that's fine. I always tighten them up anyway after the event, but you just got to ease them in. Otherwise it rocks. Because the inlet is never that perfect. Okay, so quick wipe. When I say a quick wipe, I'm not looking to remove all that lovely patina that we've created just yet. So there's your second gun, a bit of a tap in there, it's going to need a little bit more effort. Okay. So now let's do a comparison. <clears throat> Not a matched pair, that's the light mahogany for the purposes of a demonstration and that's the dark mahogany finish oh it doesn't show as good does it light mahogany need to sort out my lighting that's the dark mahogany slightly darker color and the rusting effects are slightly variable but they certainly don't look like those weird shiny things that originally came here you get them in frame for you uh, not going to behave now is it check my camera rubbish angles tend to work below my camera angle in actual fact sort of placed above me there you go you get an idea what they look like so that's the antiquing process it's a dip, bit different from the usual but uh, nonetheless that now looks like a pair of reasonably old dog lock English Civil War pistols and they do look a bit like they've like the ones that are represented by the Royal Armoury this would be darker it does age and goes almost black on the uh, really old guns and that's that's a personal choice issue really so that's all folks if you like what I do like and subscribe thanks